Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Devin, yeah. for the generous introduction. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks, everyone, for being here. A lot of friendly faces, some former students and friends, and it's really nice uh, on a Sunday evening for, for you to be here. So, um, yeah, it is. I got a hot mic. Turn it down a bit. AV hasn't been our friend this evening. <laughs> Apologies for the late start. I think that's good. I'm talking louder and it's not feedback. -ing. So I'm, I'm working off borrowed equipment here. So uh, part of what that means is uh, all my notes have shrunk to like size 8 font. <laughs> so if I spend a lot of time doing this, that's why. Um, this is almost an entirely uh, PowerPoint-driven uh, presentation. It's, it's really based on images uh, from the comic book series and uh, a lot of material, like not all the materials on the slide. So we can do sort of like a Wizard of Oz thing here and you can just sort of like ignore the man next to the screen. Um, and you can all see, all right? Okay. So let's just... Um, Dive right in. So this presentation was originally about ways that male authors imagine female characters and femininity in comic books. It was originally intended as an exercise in male fantasy and could be framed within the scope of what Jung refers to as his anima concept. Uh, as I delved into the material and as current events unfolded in our society, culturally, politically, and socially, I very quickly saw a deeper and much darker dimension to this material. The ways that not only male authors, but male doctors, male scientists, in their historical othering of the female body, have manipulated, physically imprinted, and otherwise encoded the female form for male personal, ecclesiastical, and political purpose. In other words, what began as an exploration of a feminine, dark eros in comic books turned into an exploration of dark eras as projected and written onto women through male authorship and imagination. This is nothing less than what we have seen almost daily in the news over the past few months regarding male power and dominance in television and the film industry, and of course in the presidency itself. All of this co-occurring within the context of the unexpected and completely disorienting at best and totally annihilating at worst Thomas Fire and subsequent and devastating mudslides, which claimed the lives of over 20 and destroyed over 100 structures and homes in Montecito and the surrounding area. All of this will form the backdrop to this entire presentation, whether invited or not. Both the Thomas Fire and the debris flow mudslides are and will as we contemplate endings and beginnings, and at this time of year, renewal, fire can assist us in attempting to understand the mystery of deaths and anticipated rebirths, something religious traditions have attempted to ritualize and harness the power of for millennia. For there is very little that is older than fire, and along with fire come those of us who watch it, stoke it, and even worship it. Even but perhaps, perhaps accept when the fire comes knocking quite literally on our front doors. So this is a presentation not only about dying and anticipated rising, and the ways that we do that, imagine that, and even assume that it's possible, but even more so about being pushed to the limits of human experience, and asking ourselves, when we have lost everything, who are we? Where do we go? What do we become? And what left do we have to give when everything has gone up in flames or lies buried in the mud? So I want to start, um, sort of had my, my prelude, little Bruce Springsteen. Um, I really want to start with this poem uh, that was gifted to me by a student in the counseling program um, who was part of our trauma uh, certificate training this past winter. And this is a, a poem by a woman in Ohio. And it was printed in Ohio during the Thomas Fire. And it's called Moonfire. 
She took our hearts and melted them in the ceremonial ring of sand. But everything is fire now. Everything is fire. A flick of tail, wind and dress, a dance around our rim, a little further in. She drove us out, but drove us in. Everything is fire now. Everything is fire. All the remains of what is lost, and all that remains of what is found, in the light that shines from the moon, valley of the magic of the fire moon, where everyone is fire now, embers in the ash, spirit seeds in the land of beginning, where love is our fire now, love is our fire. We rise in the spirit of the valley of the moon. And as you probably know, or you may or may not know, that's the translation for OI is the valley of the moon. And this is the poet Akabi and Norman uh, from uh, uh, Classic Letterpress. And you can see the press, and you can see them wearing the masks, and you can see this ceremonial ring of fire here around the town of Owen. I mean, I think this image is pretty much embedded in everyone's minds at this point. So there's an ambivalence in the chorus to Bruce Springsteen's Atlantic City. Maybe, maybe everything that dies someday comes back. You can't tell. There's an uncertainty. But regardless, there's this resilience. There's this movement forward, even into the dark world of organized crime. This world of dark hope also becomes dark possibility. Atlantic City is one of Springsteen's most dour songs. It depicts a young couple's romantic escape to the New Jersey seaside town, where the man in the relationship intends to take a job in organized crime. The song wrestles with the inevitability of death and the hope of rebirth in various ways especially in life and in the city itself, which was going through an attempted mob takeover while the state government was trying to implement casino gambling. So it, it's, it's the cultural dimension of the psyche as well, that these rebirths that we go through aren't just individual, and they aren't even just communal, right? but there's also a political and a cultural dimension as well. Uh, James, James Hillman's uh, was it City and Soul, one of the volumes of his, his collective editions. Cities go through the transformations and rebirths, um, just as was, you know, the same with people. And that's actually where I want to begin. And this is the town I grew up in, Phoenixville. <laughs> and so uh, Phoenixville, PA, uh, about 20 miles west of Philadelphia. Uh, when I grew up, it looked like this. And it was a pretty typical post-industrial uh, Pennsylvania town. Um, in the early 80s, a lot of the steel industry started to go overseas, and a lot of the mills closed. Uh, what the city, what happened, right, um, so, I mean, so how did it get from like the booming steel age to decline to what it looks like now? And they do, uh, they redid the, the foundry building, and they do weddings and events, and it costs some ridiculous amount of money to rent it. Right? So how did it get from here to there? Maybe 15 years ago, a few creative, entrepreneurial, visionary folks decided that they were going to use art and the mythology of the spirit of the town to create what they called the Firebird Festival. They followed the, sort of the Burning Man theme, and every December, a couple weeks before the solstice, uh, right in the middle of town, at the lumber yard where there was a big space, they constructed a giant fire bird. And what they did was there was a local pottery studio and then they would fire all the clay inside the bird. They would light a fire. They had people doing drumming and dancing. I mean, it was this total like, like Bacchanal. And through this event, which turned into a couple hundred people, 500 people, 1,000 people, right? a couple of thousand people, something started to happen in the town through art through the creative aspect of the psyche. And through this process, people started thinking, oh, these people are coming here. You gotta feed them. They need stuff to drink. So it led to what eventually has become now, 15, 20 years later, like one of the most desired places to move to, the highest brew pubs per capita sort of thing. Right? And some of the rentals are even 
compared to Santa Barbara rates. Mm -hmm. Wow, I know, who knew? <laughs> 2200 for a one bedroom. It's like, what? <laughs> There's some images. It's huge. I mean, it's, it's absolutely gigantic. You can see the scale of people standing to the side. Now, this is art and ritual space that's intentionally cultivated and intentionally created with an intentional outcome and with a lot of fire trucks. <laughs> this is an image that many of you have seen. What happens when we don't invoke ritually and sacramentally the presence of fire in a container that can be held? What happens when the fire comes to us? And the fire can be a metaphor. Right? It's very literal in this case. It's like we're talking about right there, you know. But fire is anything that comes into our life that's unexpected. Anything that challenges our, our egoic structures that think that they can control the outcomes and the comings and goings of our lives. Right? So this mass, so this massive, massive, largest on record fire in the history of California. I have a feeling that that's not the first time y'all been through a fire that size, right? And that's the, and that's what this that's what this one of the pieces that came up so strong for me was really this piece of our resilience. You know, how do we get through? What's it take to get through? What do I have to get me through? Right? And that's something that it's an internal external thing because there's the inner resilience, but then there's also the communal resilience what it takes for the community and people to pull together to get through. So here's a little program for this evening's performance. Uh, it's on your handout too, so you can follow along just so you don't get lost. As you can tell, there's a bunch of acts, scenes, it's a little bit labyrinthine, and I want you to be able to follow along. So um, you got that with you, I think. If you don't, maybe more, maybe. Uh, Oh, they're in the back. Okay. So what we're going to do tonight is we're going to explore what Jung would call the archetype of rebirth in its many manifest manifestations as the phoenix, but focus specifically on a feminist and a depth psychological reading of her birth, death, and resurrection through one specific cultural historical frame. The X-Men comic book series from the 1960s to the present day how male fantasy has envisioned a female character capable of stretching and bending the limitations of time, space, and matter, even exhibiting powers over life and death itself. We're going to ask questions about what of her is feminine or archetypal, what is, heck, what is hers versus what is a male fantasy of how a woman should be. And we're going to see how she returns in spite of, through, and regardless of the male voices who have attempted to capture silence and even kill her, only for her to continuously rise again. So, a little bit of a methodological piece. I'm going to do four different lenses with the material this evening. We're going to do a comparative piece, which means we're going to do like a Jungian amplification. We're going to look at the Phoenix just briefly from a bunch of different historical traditions. Um, then we're going to do a, a historical genealogy of Jean Grey, Phoenix character herself. There's the feminist piece, which I've already spoken to, and then the death psychological piece. So we're going to deliteralize the, the material, the characters, and we're going to look at it from the underside, from the perspective of the unconscious, from the perspective of psyche. And Freud and Jung, and especially Lacan, are going to be our guides in that this evening. So I'm just going to go through some of this stuff quickly, um, the Phoenix in history part. So, the phoenix is a solar deity, or associated with the solar deity. Herodotus, Pliny the Elder, Pope Clement I, Lactantius, Ovid, Isidore of Seville, all contribute to the phoenix retelling. Etymology is traced back to the ancient Greek. Mythology is potentially even earlier, going back to Egypt. The basic structure of the myth, I think many of you have a sense of this, every 500 years there's a cycle where the phoenix dies in a spectacular display of combusted light and color before either rising again or its offspring rising again from its ashes. This symbol, this mythology, has been enculturated and has outlasted religious traditions and has been incorporated into alchemy, Christianity, Dante, Shakespeare, and obviously the present day. So this is a theme, that Jung would call this an archetype of rebirth. This is something that has existed very literally since 
at least the beginning of material culture recorded history, and especially since the beginning of people starting to write down myths and stories, right? This concept of a phoenix, right, of something that can die and rise, has been with us essentially forever. That's sort of the uh, ontological piece of how Jung would call it an archetype. It's an archetype. It's something that has a priori always been there. So just focusing on one specific tradition in Western alchemy, here's a symbol of the phoenix uh, to your left, representing all four elements. So we have earth, air, water, and fire, all represented in the phoenix symbol. And then on the right, uh, phoenix almost as a symbol, for those of you that are versed in alchemical language, uh, phoenix almost as a symbol of the philosopher's stone, uh, representing the, the totality of the work. Sulfur, uh, sulfur, mercury, and, um, <coughs> sulfur, mercury, and salt. Here's another image from an alchemical manuscript uh, from the 18th century. You can see a uh, phoenix on the right, pelican on the left. Um, interestingly here, the pelican is connected with the lunar feminine. You can see how it, it plucks its own breast to feed its young with its own blood. And then you have the phoenix associated with sulfur and the masculine principle on the right. And then this, uh, this phrase from Hadrich of Antwerp, who was a 13th century uh, Beguine, Christian Beguine mystic, where she actually references both the phoenix and alchemical imagery of the salamander in the same verse. <clears throat> so uh, just as in the fire of the salamander, the phoenix burns to ashes and metamorphoses itself. And the, the, the salamander, some of you probably know, the salamander uh, connects with sulfur, the sulfuric aspect of alchemical. A little bit more about method, because I'm obsessed with method. Um, some of my influences here uh, that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort of refer to throughout the presentation, um, and this is all in the, the bibliography, um, totally OCD, like to a T, put together for you. So everything I reference is on that piece of paper, um, just in case you want to dig into any of this stuff. So Jeff Kripal's book, Mutants and Mystics, um, a lot of stuff in there that's inspired what I'm going to talk about tonight, particularly around um, comic books as what he calls encoded gnosis. So the idea that comic books, due to their symbolic and, and imaginal character, actually encode these sort of spiritual or revelatory truths or awakenings. So it's a really great way to get into the subliminal minds of young people and send, you know, get them this sort of like, Devin was talking about the punk rock stuff. But, um, you know, why do you think young kids love comic books so much? There's a lot of really rad stuff in there that's like you got to read between the lines. It's the difference between watching The Simpsons when you're a kid and watching The Simpsons when you're an adult. And it's like, wow, I can't believe my parents let me watch that. There's a lot of stuff in there. I didn't know what was going on. It's a very similar thing in comic books. Um, Kripal follows a bit of like a post-Freudian lens, and he has this concept of super sexualities, that superpowers are actually sublimated sexual and erotic urges and drives. It's a super Freudian take, but that's very interesting. We'll get into that a little bit. And then this piece about trauma and transcendence, which is actually the title of the conference that we're doing here at Pacific in June. Um, and this quote from William James, that, that if there really are some sort of superpowers inside the psyche, a lot of times how they get out is through some sort of trauma. And we see this time and time again in the comic book world. Think about Spider-Man, bit by a radioactive spider, the Fantastic Four, right? traveling in outer space, and the gamma rays. Everything's about a gamma ray right? in, in 1960s and 70s comic books. Spaceships that are about to crash land, and they go through the Earth's orbit, and all of a sudden I'm a mutant. Like, there's always this traumatic moment that leads to an awakening of some sort of superpowers, which Kripal draws to, of course, adolescence. Like, this is what teenagers are going through. Puberty is a form of awakening, right? And it's when these sort of erotic drives and urges are coming online, and it can make a person feel like they got superpowers. I did when I was 13. I was doing all sorts of crazy stuff, right? So that's, that's another piece um, you know, that's going to come into this. And then Rumsey Fawaz has a fantastic book that just came out recently called The New Mutants, where he uses uh, queer theory and queer theory and feminist tools, but mostly from a sociological perspective. Um, to contextualize uh, comic books from the 70s and 80s. And then Chris Knoll's book, uh, great title, Our Gods Wear Spandex. So it's this sort of Joseph Campbell sort of piece about the masks of God, right? Are our superheroes really uh, sort of like the ancient gods of mythology dressed up in spandex with a cape on? Yeah. 
Um, so all of this is, is sort of forms the bedrock of which I'm, I'm sort of doing a lot of this thinking and riffing off of a lot of their work. Okay, so we're going to get right into the, the sort of genealogy here, uh, genealogy of a phoenix. It's, it's really a, looking at Jean Grey, how she becomes a phoenix and her transformation into dark phoenix. So this is 1963, right? Anybody here remember 1963? It was a crazy time. Yeah. Okay. So what? Um, this is this this uh, image on the left here really forms sort of like the, the I don't know the feminist underpinnings of really what I'm doing because it's it's the more time I spent with this image I I wanted to do the whole presentation just on this because it's actually really brilliant. Um, it's really brilliant in how unconscious it is. I think it's unconscious. I don't know what the intention of the original male author and illustrator was. But if you notice, okay, this is Jean Grey here with her new like X-Men, X-Woman suit on, and she's admiring herself in the mirror. Right? So here's the full length there. Right here. And she's having a moment of jouissance. Right? She's having this moment of self-enjoyment, taking pleasure in herself here. Simultaneously, while well, she's being objectified by a trio of admirers here, right, in their sort of like sharp, like very masculine cut suits or blazers, and, and what it creates is a double mirror. Right? So it's, it's a speculum, for those of you that know the, the uh, Belgian, uh, French, Belgian feminist uh, Luce Irgere, speculum of the other woman. So this concept of woman as mirror. And, and it's just, this is such a, a it's a loaded uh, image and a loaded metaphor here. So, so there's the mirror in which Jean sees herself. There's the mirror in which she defines herself, right? her own experience with herself, her own subjectivity, her own self-agency. But then there's also Jean as mirror. Right? Jean as the mirror in which these men see themselves. And that's the objectification and the projection piece. So there's two things happening here. Right? So what is the reflection? What is the projection? And notice their language, right? Da. It's like she's an imaginary plaything that doesn't lack that that lacks her own sort of the ability to, to have her own will or, or agency, right? Poured, right? Poured into that uniform. So this is the language of liquidity, right? This liquid language that there's a fluidity to her identity. There's a malleability. This is the, the perennial uh, male prejudice of the female body, that it's soft, right? Which, of course, then becomes concretized that, 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 that femininity needs to be soft, right? So the softness of the feminine body, which is able to be inscribed, versus the hard, chiseled bodies of a more traditional masculinity. Right? You following me so far, please? Yeah. Right. So, and then the image on the, on the right, we have Jean as a pinup girl. Right? Look at the proportions. Like when I first saw this, like I thought it was like the opposite of Alice in Wonderland, like where she, like, instead of shrinking, she gets like super huge. Like that's her superpower. I mean, the the proportion in the illustration here is so off. I mean, she is gigantic. The body, the curves of her body, have completely taken over the panel, and her powers are secondary. Like it looks like she's just knocking over like. But the, what she's actually doing here is manipulating matter with her mind, right? That's pretty badass, but instead of focusing on the superpowers, what we get instead is a Marvel Masterworks pinup, right? It's about her body. It's not about her superpowers. So hold these images in mind, because this is like the earliest version of the X-Men, which tanked, by the way. The X-Men did not do well when it first appeared in the 60s, and we're going to see how she's revisioned and revised as we go along. So this is just another example here of how like, she was the only X-Men. It was her and all the dudes, right? like you see in most movies today, where it's one woman and like four dudes, and that's sort of the, the action-adventure team. The female of the species, because she's the only one, right? And then this other piece on the right, just to give you a sense of um, you know, her superpowers. So she's a telepath, and she can not only control and manipulate physical objects with her mind, but she also hears voices, so she can hear the thoughts and pick up on the feelings of others. So, this is the trauma piece, the trauma and transcendence piece. So, how does she first awaken to her mutant abilities? So, this is, from, uh, this, is a, this is not from the 60s, this is from 1989. So, when Jean was 10 years old, she was playing with her best friend, when her friend was hit by a car and died in front of her. 
This moment of extreme physical and emotional trauma awakened her telepathic powers, which were initially torturous for her. And I don't know if you can, can you read this? In the back? Yeah. Um, so this is sort of a, this is, this is a flashback scene from a comic book that's being narrated by someone else. So what's happened is that her friend get hit by the car. Uh, you, you, so this is him speaking to Jean. You cradled your dying friend in your arms and suddenly found yourself inside her mind, sharing her thoughts as they went out one by one. And if you know the, the um, NDE, the near-death experience literature, there's tons of it that's come out in the past like 25 years, even Alexander's book. Like, a lot of NDE experiences, like, like, this is stuff that people have reported these experiences of being able to sort of tap into other people, feeling or experience or even hearing the life force going out of others, people that are empaths or highly intuitive people. That's pretty terrifying. If I could suddenly, all of a sudden, hear your thoughts right now, like, oh my god, he needs to stop, it's so hot in here. I really need to use the bathroom. Like, I wouldn't really be able to do what I'm doing right now. Now imagine if you could do that all the time. Um, so, not an easy ability to control could very, very easily lead to driving somebody crazy. So, we're going to move into the 70s, and what happens is Chris Claremont, who was probably the most successful comic book writer of all time, has sold, I read 100 million copies somewhere, I read 750 million comic book copies somewhere else. He's sold between 100 and 750, 750 million comic books in his life. He's the reason that the X-Men, and you know who they are today, pretty much all the movies that have come out, the, the part one, two, three, and then the Wolverine stuff and all that, it's all based on stuff from the comic books that he wrote in the 70s and the 80s. Claremont was like the brilliant mind of Marvel Comics. Um, he was a Bard College graduate. Um, he wanted to get into acting and screenwriting, and he ended up landing a job at Marvel, and he was just so talented that he, got a, he wrote his first comic, I think he was like 24, 26, and you know, he, he, he had such, they just gave him total creative freedom, sort of, to really create what became the X-Men Empire. So what he does is he recreates the character of Jean Grey, he creates Phoenix, and then her evolution and transformation from this sort of Marvel, Marvel girl pin-up character into what becomes the Phoenix and the Dark Phoenix. That's what we're going to get into now. So this is like the basic plot line of how Jean becomes Phoenix. So they're in outer space, because you're always in outer space in a comic book, at least at some point. So while Jean is saving her teammates from an imminent death in outer space, right, so the, 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 they're on like a NASA looking spaceship and it's coming back into the Earth's atmosphere. And it's like spinning out of control and Jean is keeping the plane going with her telekinetic powers but there's all this radiation that the other people can't be exposed to, right? So she like seals them off in a back room and now she's piloting the ship solo like with her mind. That's what's happening here. So she sacrifices herself to keep the team safe aboard the spaceship by telekinetically holding the ship together and then running the show. She's doing this alone. So, in doing this, upon re-entry to the Earth's atmosphere, Jean exposes herself to this deadly radiation, which destroys her physical form, only to be psychically and corporally, so like her, like her body, is knit back together by this mytho-archetypal cosmic entity called the Phoenix Force. Right? Suspension of belief. That's what happens. Right? Her physical form is dying, We'll see images of what that looks like. And then this, this archetypal force that is feminine comes to her and knits her back together as this super being. Right? So we're just going to hold that for now. Now, keep in mind this is 1977. Right? This is like the height of women's liberation movement. So Ramsey Fawaz situates that within this cultural, you know, the, Occurrence. So he's saying that Jean's transformation illustrates her liberation from the constraints of traditional American woman. So the traditional American woman stays at home, sacrifices herself, sacrifices having a career to raise the family to do the domestic stuff. Right? That, that piece there is what we see mirrored and transformed through the Phoenix retelling as she becomes like 
Beyonce before there was Beyonce. Like that's that's what you're gonna see. Okay. So what happens here? Okay. The ship crash lands in Florida, Cape Canaveral, and Jean rises okay, from the from the water as her newly costumed self in this profound and powerful declaration of her new identity and womanhood. She, I, she is self-identified with the very powers of life and death. You can see on the right. I am no longer the woman you knew. He has a very clear statement. I am fire and life incarnate. Now and forever I am Phoenix. So this is, the, this is like one of many rebirths and identity shifts and transformations that she goes through. And later in the plot line, again, you got to just sum, I got to summarize some more space travel for you. Um, so later in the plot line, Jean as Phoenix transports the X Men team thousands of light years away from the Earth to an uninhabited planet that houses what is called the Macron Crystal. Okay? What is the Macron Crystal? I'm going to let you read between the lines. It's a massive pink button. It's a crystal. It contains the energies of the entire universe. Okay? And you got, you got where I'm going with this piece. Okay. So, in other words, what's that? It's not, I don't know what you're saying. Okay. <laughs> so, in other words, um, next to Gene, next to this Phoenix Force, this, this pink crystal might be the most powerful thing in the universe. Just saying. Just you know, okay. let that land out there, okay? So, what happens is the X-Men, and they have to like save this thing, because it's like this evil, dark, masculine force wants to corrupt it and take it over. Does this sound familiar? Right? So the X-Men need to step in, and they need to save the day. So they find themselves in the midst of this cosmic battle between Lalandra, who's down there on the right, with her awesome hairdo, and her brother, Deken, who's this guy up here with his not-so-great hairdo, and they're in this like midst of this like cosmic battle, and um, and they gotta like they gotta like save the day. Right. So Deken obviously becomes this example of, of this dark patriarchal, you know, we're gonna call using Lacan's term the phallic a phallic masculinity. And I don't mean that in a positive way. I mean that in a, in a controlling, dominating sort of power oriented way. So he's like out of control. He's like. Sorry, he's the Donald Trump of the galaxy. He wants that pink button, and he not want to get it. Because right? you know what he thinks he can do? He can just grab. <laughs> so then the X-Men are going to let that happen. So it's the battle for this cosmic pink crystal. Um, and what happens? Okay. So obviously the X-Men defeat the guy, but it's Phoenix. Right? It's Phoenix. That is able, she's the only one that's able to enter the crystal. And what she does is she reweaves the shattering fabric of the cosmos. And this is what's so interesting, right? And, and this is part of Chris Claremont's brilliance. The way that he, he works with his illustrators to, to really capture what, what it could look like to really reweave and reorient like some sort of a psychic web or psychic structure. Right? So this archetypal Phoenix Force that Jean is just beginning to identify with, this is like a moment of, we could just call this one of the first moments where she exhibits what we're calling this feminine jouissance. We'll talk about what that means later. But it serves as a power to reconstruct the very nature of life itself. And you can see in the text here, her, it, it, it is, it, it's right there. I'm not making it up. Her joy sustains her. So it is this moment of jouissance where her identity and the identity of the phoenix sort of weave and interweave and, and, and sort of meld together. And she's having, she's like not really sure on Jean yet on Phoenix. You know, like for those of you that have ever experienced, I don't know, we'll just call it some sort of a possession state, whether it's anger or whether it's something more positive or whatever. Like there is, it can be hard to differentiate, right? I got some coworkers in the room that know sometimes I can see red and all of a sudden it's like, you know? It's not always so easy to differentiate between self and affect or self and archetype. Right? The Jungians in the room probably get that. And, and this is a really beautiful exp uh, like expression of that. Okay, so 
the, the lattice work, the cosmos, the, the, the structure here is dying, and Jean, through this cosmic jouissance, like you can see blasting it from her like third eye, she's, she regrows this cosmic web. And it's like visually stunning. I don't know how much you can, can read there, but um, you can see how she grows and from the left to the right, she grows in this cosmic force. She gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's this incineration of personality and transpersonal identity. Right? Uh, there's that line where she no longer knows whether she's human or a goddess. I'm sure there's at least one person in the room that's had that experience at some point in their life, maybe. Or man, I don't know. Um, so, uh, yeah. Right. And then what happens? So out of that moment of chaos, out of this complete dissolution and fragmentation, like the universe is like going to explode and she's the only one that can save the day and it's like, oh my God. Right. What happens? There's this, again, for the Jungians here, there's this moment of emergence where, where all of a sudden this self-organizes. Right? This, you know this phrase from Jung about the self-organizing capacity of the psyche that's like when everything is going to, like, going to shit and you're like crisis mode and fragmentation if you're working with a client, if you're a therapist, right? Sometimes there are these moments when maybe a symbol emerges, right, where there's a moment of clarity, where there's something that's on the other side of the going to pieces that structures the chaos. And it's so interesting. So Chris Claremont was a quarter Jewish. I can't remember if he's, he was half Jewish on his mother or his father's side, but it's interesting that the image that he chooses to represent this order from chaos is the Kabbalistic tree of life. And look who's right in the middle. It's Phoenix. Right? So Phoenix is the heart. She becomes the unifying principle. Right? In her jouissance, her feminine force, the ability that she has to, to re-knit the cosmos forms the center of this self-organizing symbol that holds the universe in balance. Whoa. <laughs> but then what happens? Again, for the Jungians, you know this term from Heraclitus, enantiodromia. Enantiodromia, when one thing goes so far to one uh, extreme that it comes out in its opposite. So she's in this moment of being so identified with the bliss and the positive aspect of the Phoenix Force that what happens? All of a sudden the negative or the dark side erupts. And she can't handle it. Right? She's so identified with the light, she's so identified with herself as this good sort of savior of the cosmos, that what does she do? Okay. So here's where it emerges. We have the light side and the dark side, creation and destruction. So what does she do? She battles with it, she splits. So it's essentially like this sort of dissociative split happens where we have the, the, the light and the dark side battling. And what does she say? I deny you. I cast you out. We all know that doesn't work out so well. And again, like it's super visually stunning. I mean, like if we deliteralize this and look at this from like a like an imaginal internal depth psychological perspective, I mean, how many of y'all have done that with yourselves in, in one in one sense or another? You know, banished an aspect of yourself that you that you weren't really ready to be friends with or sit down and play chess with. And what happens? So this leads into the birth of you know the return of the repressed. The dark phoenix. And it's so interesting how she gets imagined, right? And this is a lot of where the male fantasy component comes in super strong because she gets imagined and illustrated as this super like BDSM dominatrix. <laughs> male fantasy of a dark devouring feminine, right? or at least a dominating one. Okay? And here we see visually displayed, at least up until the 1980, the evolution of Jean Grey in her different costumes. <coughs> so, another plot line that I have to summarize for you in 30 seconds. I apologize. So, this is around what's called the Hellfire Club. And they're this gang of, like, baddies. It always happens in Manhattan. Right? Comic book here. That's, Manhattan's a place to be if you're a superhero. So, there's 12 issues between 1979 and 1980 that narrates Jean Grey's loss of control over the Phoenix Force and her transformation into Dark Phoenix. So the negative aspect of the previous positive aspect of the Phoenix Force. So the seeds are sown through a plot by the Hellfire Club, led by this dude with a really bad beard, 
Uh, his name is Mastermind, who attempts to deceive Jean into joining their forces through an ongoing mind transfer erotic fantasy that ultimately forces her to question the nature of her identity until she finally succumbs to its seduction. Right? Hey. So, what happens? He pushes her too far, completely destabilizes her mind, which unleashes something he never could have imagined, which was this dark phoenix force inside of her. Right? And what does she do? She melts his mind. And how does she do it? She, like, I mean, she's Shakti. She's the divine feminine principle, essentially, if I can just transpose that onto that, right? So she gives him a vision of the scope and the magnitude of the entire cosmos itself, which him, being that he's like, you know, this, I mean, we'll just stay with the metaphor. He's like this Trumpy kind of like very myopic, uh, dark, masculine dude who just wants to take everything over and control everything. So his vision is like this, and she goes, <sighs> blows him open to the expanse of the universe, and he just like completely goes crazy. Don't mess with the phoenix. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, here we have her. Again, the same script. That's what's so interesting. I am no longer the woman you knew. It's the repetition. It's another identity cycle. I am no longer the woman you knew. I am fire, life, and incarnate. Now and forever, I am Phoenix. Witness the birth of a god. Boom. Right. Now, what happens? Because she's super unleashed at this point. Right? She's pissed, she's angry, and this is, remember, like for those of you that are into the dark feminine piece and you know that energy, like it's hungry, it's insatiable. Um, so, she sends herself off into space, Cause she's and, and what do you do when you're like that powerful and you're that hungry? Uh, I think I'm just gonna go eat a sun. The sun's <laughs> got a lot of energy, right? So so she just plunges into this sun and she like eats it. She consumes it. But what happens? He doesn't realize that that sun is sustaining the life of the galaxy, which has a planet, which has all these cool looking like Smurf people on it, and like. They all die. And right, so there's something like, what did it say? Uh, I don't know. There were a lot of people, like a billion or something. Like a lot of people died. Okay? So this has some very political consequences, both for her and for us and our reading of the story that we're going to get into. But for the sake of plot summary, right, Phoenix, she gets a little punished. So here we are, here's our friend Lilandra again. And the phoenix must be destroyed. All right? But now she's split, because the X-Men are like, no, Jean Grey, we love her. Right? And of course there's a love interest, Cyclops, for those of you who know, know the story. Cyclops is like, no, she's my woman. You know? But then there's like, ah, oh, dark phoenix, she can do anything, she's going to kill us all. So there's this, there's this split, and there's this struggle between the human and the archetypal. So they want to kill the archetypal and save the human. I don't work like that. So what happens is, this is like the sort of tragic, I mean, it's total, it's like Greek tragedy in modern dress. Um, so should they kill her, should they not? Cyclops is in love with her, right? So what happens? Again, now, I don't like this. I don't like how they did this. And a lot of people didn't like how they did this, but this is what made this, this run of the X-Men so controversial and sold so many copies. She kills herself. So nobody else has to do it, right? This is like, this kind of upsets me because it's like, well, this is a regression. Here we are again. Like, this is, the, this is like the sort of classic, like, standard what, the, what, the, what, the, what the, the good woman or the good wife is supposed to do. It's like sati in the, in the, um, in the, oh God, the myth of, you know what I'm talking about. Shiva, the wedding, sati, right? She immolates herself. So it's the same thing. So the woman has to sacrifice herself, and she takes on responsibility for something that might not have been her entirely her responsibility. And so she takes it all on herself. It's the heroic self-sacrificing of the feminine. So she trains the laser. There's this. this there's a laser because there's always a laser when you're in outer space. With her mind, she presses the trigger and she kills herself. But what this does is that it denies the responsibility or the agency 
for the other parties and the imperial powers that were responsible for her creation. Right? We have to keep in mind how she became Dark Phoenix because she was being co-opted and coerced by this dark masculine force that was trying to control her. Where's, where are those folks? Where they got to take responsibility? Like, they don't. Part of it's because she made them look mad. But this is, this is problematic for me. You know, this is, this is highly problematic. And this still happens. Right? So, so there's no blame of anyone else, and Jean takes everything on herself, and she, and she commits suicide, pretty much. And then they have a funeral for her. Right? And she was young. I'm not so good at math. 24? <laughs> so, what happens? Because this was like super controversial. Because all the people love Phoenix. <clears throat> and five years passes in the Marvel thing, and some other writers are like, we're going to bring her back. <laughs> so, how do you do that? It's like, she's dead. So this is the big thing. So, it turns out that there's a discovery at the base of Jamaica Bay. Yeah, we're in New York. Something at the bottom of that. What is it? They bring the capsule up. Oh my god. It's Jean. <laughs> she was at the bottom of the ocean all this time. That means she never really died. How? Right? So how do they explain this? Right? And this is where, for you film folks, it sort of starts to jump the shark, which is like my favorite Hollywood phrase. Jumps the shark a little bit. Now how does this happen? So this is another flashback scene. And, it, and they try to explain how. Remember what I was saying? The, the spaceship is going into the Earth and it's falling apart and she's keeping it together with her psychic abilities. And so right before she dies, Farrah Fawcett appears to her, apparently, <laughs> and as this, like, you know, poofed out rad 80s, like, I don't know, I mean, she's like in pretty good shape, right? Superwoman, and she's like this archetypal sort of goddess figure She's the Phoenix Force. Right? And, and what happens here is, um, so she's dying, like her body is decomposing, um, and this figure appears to her, and she's all torn. She's like, I, you know, I want to save my friends, but I, you know, I don't want to die, and I want everything, because I'm a young person, and I don't want to have to sacrifice anything. You need to help me do this. And then there's this line at the bottom. In this case, I dance with the devil himself. So this is Faust, right? Now we're, in the, now we're in the Faustian world. So she makes a pact with, not the devil, but close. She makes a pact with this Phoenix Force energy that's like, I'm going to give you my life force if you give me your powers. Right? And what happens is her body, now you can see, she starts to become shriveled and emaciated like a skeleton. And the, the, the goddess Phoenix Force figure like cradles her in this womb, saves her physical form, and then somehow is able to like transfer her life force into her so she can become this incarnate energy. So now that now Phoenix Force has a human form that she can now go and like live her life and like do her thing and eat planets and stuff like that. Uh, it's, does it work? I don't know. I mean, it kind of makes sense, but this is, uh, this is never going to make sense. Does it need to make sense? What I like about this is how it plays with this, the human and the divine, the personal, the transpersonal, the ego and the archetype thing. Right? I, like, I like what it does with that, but it jumps the shark for sure. So we have this cosmic protector figure, and then we have Jean's body that right, says so she never died. So what that means is that when she comes back to life, she can do what she always wanted to do, which is have adventures with her sexy man, and then they can get married and like have their little heteronormative fantasy and live happily ever after, right? Now, it, it gets crazy, I don't wanna get into this, but like, like, they have a daughter from another plot line that happened in the future, and then the daughter comes back to the present day, and it, like, it's another crazy storyline. But the point is they have a daughter named Rachel, and she becomes a phoenix, that's cool. And then they have all these other kids that, yes, I, uh, I, I became so obsessed with this research, I did find a family tree. <laughs> <laughs> Email me if you want to see it. It's too much. So we're just going to take a little collective breath here. 
are you are you with me? Like, is this like, is this a lot? It's a lot of stuff. And when we're almost done. We're gonna take a break in like five minutes. Um, I just want to make sure the plot line, the basic plot lines, are clear so far. Okay. So two more acts to go. Uh, yeah, I'm going to skip this for now because I'm going to do interpretation in part two. Yeah. Okay, so now we're in the new millennium. Uh, for those of you know that go, for those of you that know Grant Morrison, he's done some crazy stuff with comic books, starting with the Invisibles, um, which actually inspired the character of Neo and the whole um, what do you call it thing? Matrix. Matrix. Thank you. So Grant Morrison's done some really cool stuff. Um, totally, uh, he had very, very um, young experiences with LSD and meditating in Tibet, and he had this crazy out-of-body experience and saw some Buddhas, and a lot of that stuff then influenced his comic book writing, so he is always encoding these sort of Gnostic and mythological and spiritual themes into his comic books. So he does some crazy stuff with the X-Men. Right? So the basic plot line with, this, with the um, Phoenix in this series um, is that she's starting to spontaneously manifest phoenix level abilities, unintentionally. So her psyche's starting to crack, and the phoenix energy's starting to get out, right? And we all know what happened last time that happened, so everyone gets all nervous. Right? So Professor X, Charles Xavier, the head of the school, he wants to do some tests to see what's happening with her abilities. Right? Okay, so take a look for yourself, and what happens? Right? What happens with this little test? doing, what's happening for her. Um, Charles asks, can I talk to the phoenix? And he says over here, nobody wants people to die again, all that stuff. And what happens when the phoenix responds? Oh, very chilling. Mm -hmm. Gene is only the house where I live, Charles. <laughs> so the phoenix is there. She's got this awesome ability to play with utensils. <laughs> but, and again, I'm not making this stuff up. If you look at the full frame of the image, like, yeah. where, what's she doing <laughs> with her hands? <laughs> like, what's going on here? Like, I'm, so this is Jeff Kripal's thing about the, this concept of the erotic, that there's a connection between the sacred and the sexual. Right? This is Kundalini, this is Kundalini Shakti. Like, it isn't the first time anybody suggested that there's a connection between the genitals and spiritual powers that happen at the top of the head. So this is sort of like a tantric revisioning of superpowers. This is this, this, the super sexualities as superpowers sort of piece that, that I was talking about earlier. So this is kind of interesting. There's no dichotomy here between the physical and the, let's just call it the sacred. So what happens is, the, you know, her and Charles continue this dialogue, and he gives her, the, like, he opens up this vision to her of, like, like this apocalyptic vision that's pretty dark. Right? And she's talking about herself. I am born and consumed in blood, flame and sacrifice. I mean, it's like Kali. Like, this is, like, South Asian, like, Shakta Tantric kind of stuff here. And Charles says, what is this place? You know, what's happening? And then this is very interesting what Jean says here. It's not a place. It's not a place. It's how it feels to be the last hope and to know that you will win against all odds. It's the wing of the phoenix touching your heart with flame. I was working on this presentation while the Thomas Fire was like literally like working its way towards me. And we're putting the slide together as like the ashes are coming down around my house and like covering my entire yard in like white ash. And I'm like reading this and I'm just like, all right, all right, all right. So so this is the this is the it's the jouissance, but it's also the it's the hope. Right? It's the hope. Yeah. The resilience piece that I was talking. Now, there's another crazy scene where Phoenix and Wolverine are on a spaceship that's careening out of control, and they're headed into the sun. Wait a second, didn't we already do this? And they don't know what they're going to do, and they can't figure out how they're going to survive. So, Phoenix, so Wolverine, again, like, this isn't his responsibility or his right. He mercy kills her. 
So she doesn't have to die by going into the sun. He's going to be the heroic man. And I'm just going to kill you so the sun doesn't kill you. <laughs> what? But what this ends up doing is that it unleashes the phoenix. Again, through a sort of a, 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 a let's just call it a phallic penetration. Right? And by phallic, I'm talking symbolically in a Lacanian sense. Right? So again, there's this sort of masculinist penetration, destruction of the feminine that's not invited, that's not consent. But in this case, it opens the phoenix force in a positive way that she's able to use the disintegrating asteroid and the sun's energy to rebuild their ship. I had to die to come back. All right, it's questionable, but that's how it was articulated by a male author. And then Jean dies again. This time, Magneto kills her. And again, she hatches from an egg, and she comes back 150 years later in like a Batman costume or something. Right? It's this super fiery energy. And again, she's incubated and she's hatched in service to a dark masculine principle. So it's the return of the repressed. It's the same thing happening over and over again. Right? So she, she's hatched by this dark masculine like bad guy, and she forgets who she is. She's forgetful of her true identity. So what happens? There's this really powerful reverse transformation from dark phoenix back into phoenix. She remembers who she is, her mission, her purpose of a, as a healer of a badly wounded universe. Right? So it's a modern day telling of the, the Gnostic Sophia, for those of you who know the Gnostic myth of Sophia, she falls into the earth, she gets embedded in matter, she forgets who she is, and she has to go on this sort of journey to recover her true self and her true identity. Here she is. Right? Again, with the cosmos in her hands, having to re-knit the very fabric of the, of the universe. Um, mm. I should probably stop there. It's hot. I need a break. Um, there's one more short act, and, and all it does is just it, it, it's another retelling of her. It's the personal and the transpersonal. It's the Phoenix Force. There it is, disembodied, separate from Gene. It's hungry. It's looking for a host. Uh, it has the, and what it does is, is the Phoenix Force actually resuscitates Gene's decomposing body, which she doesn't want to happen. You can see. Like, let go, it's too early, I'm not ready. And she becomes the incarnation against her will of the Phoenix Force. But what's so interesting is the way that she's humanized is through love. And it's through relationality. This is, you can't read this, but these are like all the X-Men and all her friends saying her name. And it's through that love and through her friends that it actually humanizes her and brings her back to her human form and her identity as Jean Grey. Okay. Let's take a break. Um, let's do like uh, 12 minutes. We'll come back when the big hand is on your left here. Okay. All right, act three. What is this, what is this thing? We have this, uh, all the, the marketing, the, the title, the copy, all around this concept of jouissance that I keep using. Um, so in the second part, uh, I'm going to get into a little more of what, what I'm going to call interpretive strategies. So the, the first half was about the prima materia, it was the raw data. In this case, it was image, it was story, it was plot. And now we're going to get into some of the deeper, dig down, um, and use some more theoretical constructs to look at how we can understand and interpret um, some of this material. And we're going to do this through a, a trifold lens of jouissance, possession, Hysteria as modes of interpreting religious experience. In this case, in this case, uh, women's. But you may wonder, what's this whole thing with the invisible woman and jouissance? Okay. So, uh, jouissance comes from the French joie, joy. Right? But it also has, of course, a wonderful sexual connotation. I'll let you read for yourself. Um, with, the, with the understanding then in, in French philosophical schools around Lacan and around the postmodern explosion that happened with Lacan and Derrida, 
and Michel Foucault, um, 70s and the 80s. Uh, jouissance was sort of like, became a thing. Right. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and with Lacan, this is from a, a lecture that he gave called God and Jouissance, Alternately God and Women's Jouissance. It's a lecture that he gave um, where he takes a very apophatic approach to explaining and discussing what Jouissance is. Do you know what I mean by apophatic? Apophatic is a, a tradition uh, in, the, in the Western Greek tradition, goes into Christianity. It's, it's, a, it's a process of unsaying, unsaying God, knowing God through negating God. It's also known as the via negativa. And so knowing something by knowing what it is not. So with that said, I can't really tell you what jouissance is, because according to Lacan, the jouissance which you can name is not the true jouissance, just like the Tao. Right? If you can name it, if you can know it, then you're not in it. And that's the whole idea, right? because it's not part of a phallic economy. Now, what does that mean? Right? The phallic economy is the world of a masculinist ideology. Derrida's wonderful term, phallogocentrism, for those of you that know that term. It's phallic and it is oriented around logos, which are the traditional masculine domains of life. Reason, rationality, dominance. Control, superiority, right? the alpha male structure that has both created and destroyed Western civilization, <laughs> at least structurally and politically and economically. Right? So jouissance is this, is this sexual joy. This is a very formal philosophical definition from Stan Marlin. A sexual joy that is released in an acceptance of castration, because women are already castrated in the Freudian universe, right? lack finitude and death as fundamental truths of our human limits. So it's about limitation and going beyond. Going beyond the limits of reason, going beyond the limits of corporality, the body, going along the limits of what is known, logos, going beyond a phallogocentric sort of orientation towards, towards the world. And if that doesn't make sense right now, it's okay, because it's not supposed to make sense. It's supposed to be something that Lacan's almost like a Zen master giving you a koan. He wants to sort of get you out of your mind and create more of an embodied, living, spontaneous experience of what jouissance is. Right? But we already saw it demonstrated with Phoenix soaring through the cosmos, creating and destroying worlds. That's, I mean, that's a form of jouissance. Right? Now, my question is, why does it have to be feminine? And we'll get to that in a minute. So why does it have to be gendered? But before we go there, let's talk about why Lacan crosses out women woman, puts a bar through it. Why? Why is that? Because what he says is that woman, because she doesn't have symbolic representation in society, right? what that means is our God images are mostly have been male, right? but even in society, even in economics, in a male imagined world, woman doesn't really have a symbol set to identify with and define herself. He says, in his strange logic, that then there's no such thing as woman within a man's world. And it kind of makes sense, because what happens is that woman becomes shadow. And this takes us into the realm of Jung and Jungian psychology, where, one, where Jung puts, I mean, this is really embarrassing and unfortunate, but there might be some psychological truth to it, that because woman is sort of forced into the unconscious, along with what else? She becomes equated with matter, because matter is split off from spirit, which is male. Animus is split from anima. Earth is put into the unconscious because the he heavens is always uh, in a sort of Christian medieval situation. Heaven is always superior to earth. We shun the body. We shun matter. We shun sexuality. They're all considered evil. So when we put all of those things into the unconscious, and we put we, it creates all of this psychic space to project all of those things onto woman. Right? This might be like I don't know. In alignment with maybe some people's experience in the room. I don't know, we can talk about that. But all of these aspects, matter, earth, body, sexuality, become projected onto woman and are considered something that is evil. And this is like the preeminence of the medieval imagination. If you read any sort of Christian mystical or spiritual texts, you always avoid woman, why? Because of her dangerous sexual wiles. And that is something that we see throughout the history of literature from, I mean, this is not just medieval, this goes back probably since the dawn of time, 
through the modern, almost the modern day, because now it's all starting to shift. So Lacan says, hence woman, unwritten, with a bar through it. So this is back to, takes us back to the earlier piece about the speculum, the mirror. So woman becomes a mirror that serves as the reflective surface in which a man constitutes his identity. So a man is never really seeing a woman. A man is usually seeing some aspect of himself that he doesn't want to see or can't see or whatever. Right? At least at the love at first sight stage. Maybe after 20 years of marriage it gets a little different. I don't know. But there's always an initial projection or a fantasy. Now, instead of trying to explain what jouissance is, Lacan gives an example. And his example is Bernini's famous sculpture of Teresa of Avila in ecstasy, which he describes as the least bad thing I have ever done. <laughs> right? This is a very good example of the excess of the Baroque. And you can see from the, the very exquisite detail that she is completely enraptured. But it's interesting because this is still a man's replication of a woman in ecstasy. It's a male fantasy of a woman in ecstasy. So it's very interesting. It's still an outsider perspective projecting onto a woman's subjective interior, this time concretizing it in marble or stone. And here's another Bernini sculpture, similar. And this is Teresa from her own words. Very erotic. Uh, I'm going to read the whole thing. So there's an angel, right? I saw in the angel's hands a long golden spear. And at the point of the iron, there was a little fire that he thrust several times into my heart that penetrated to my entrails. Again, <laughs> doesn't take a whole lot of imagination. What's below the entrails? So we're moving from the heart downward into or of the genital region of the body. So there is an erotic component here. And a spear is perhaps one of the more phallic symbols we could use. So there's this penetration, and then when he pulls it out, it seems that he was drawing my entrails from me, leaving me all on fire with a wondrous love for God. The pain was so great that it caused me to utter several moans, and so exceedingly sweet is this greatest of pains that is impossible to desire to be rid of it. Right, so this is, this is classic Christian mystical writings about this sort of tragic, romantic, uh, come hither and then depart, you know, uh, love, courtly love poetry that we see all throughout um, Christian medieval writings from both men and women. Right. Now, what does Lacan have to say about this? Because he, he creates almost a cult figure of, of Teresa. Right? And this is very interesting, because this is Lacan almost as like a tantra shaktik. It's a shaktik tantric, tantric. Naturally, you're all going to be convinced that I believe in God. I believe in the jouissance of woman. So what Lacan does here is he elevates jouissance to a, a numinous or a divine status. Right? So where he, the, the last quote, why not interpret one face of the other, the God face, as based on feminine jouissance. So here he is arguing for a feminine face of God that he's basing on Teresa's erotic ecstasy. That's not the God I grew up with. <laughs> I wish, but it wasn't. So this is the beginnings of, you know, I mean, so much wonderful work has been done since uh, 1973. I mean, the whole birth of women's studies, multiple waves of feminist movement. But, I mean, this is still pretty radical now, imagine in 1973. Like, this is a, this is a psychoanalysis I can get behind. Right? And then you can read the second quote, and you can have fun with that. Um, yeah. So there's a whole development then of this, this, this concept or this experience which we saw throughout psychoanalysis, starting with Lacan, uh, Luce Irigere, who I mentioned, the Belgian psychoanalyst, who was a student of Lacan's until he kind of kicked her out of school because um, she challenged him on his points. She accused him of being too foul or egocentric. Um, Julia Christave has written on Teresa. Uh, uh, Catherine Clément, um, really brilliant book um, on rapture, where she describes Jouissance as an orgasm of the ego. Michael Eigen, the New York psychoanalyst, Jouissance as the goal of psychoanalysis. So the goal of psychoanalysis here is not a well-developed ego that can function in society. It's actually a person who can walk around having a spontaneous experience of Jouissance. 
And it's a very different conception and definition of psychoanalysis. And then Elliot Wolfson, who actually just spoke here last week, um, explores the possibilities of jouissance with or without another. Is this, is, do you need another person? Do you need a god? Right? So this is the apophatic dimensions of jouissance that I've mentioned before. Uh, I'm going to skip the critique piece. We can come back to that later. Um, come back to that later. Just to, if you need me anymore to draw off the connection a little tighter between Dark Phoenix and Feminine Jouissance, there's erotic and sexualized imagery throughout the whole series. Um, Chris Claremont says himself about Dark Phoenix, it was the quest for the cosmic orgasm. Right? My question is, who, well, whose orgasm is it? Because we always have to ask the gender question, is it a male orgasm or is it a female orgasm? Or is it a non-binary orgasm, I don't know. Cyclops has a great flair, her power is turning her on, an all-consuming lust. Uh, I mean, there's just so much, there's just so much examples of the eroticization of the dark phoenix energy. It's just, it's very interesting. And then again, just to, just to sort of comparatively put all of these side by side, this is an image from, from the very early Jean Grey turning into phoenix. She's driving the spaceship through outer space, and she's dying. But it ain't what it looks like it's happening here. Right? And we can compare that again to this other image that, that we sort of connect the, uh, you know, the we'll just call it the, the yoni with the higher chakras. Uh, and then, of course, it takes us back to Teresa. So it's this connection about this category of the erotic and this connection of eros to the numinous. And that, again, you know, a lot of this, like, so why am I doing this? Like, oh my, like, what's, you know, What's this about for me? A lot of it is about the recovery of, of Eros. That's what a lot of this is about. It's about the recovery of feminine and the recovering the feminine face of God. And it's about recovering Eros as, as a part of, of the sacred. Right? Um, everybody, I mean, I don't think there's anybody that's grown up in a Western context that doesn't have some sort of a split between, between sex and spirit. And it's been extremely damaging for, for many, if not all of us. And a little bit more, I, I mentioned Kali before and Tantric, the, the Shakta Tantric tradition. Um, I mean, there's just Kali stuff in here all over the place, not just with her language, but also from a deeper sort of archetypal psychology. Um, the, the, like, why is she dark? Why does she, what, what is dark phoenix? She's dark phoenix because she's a devourer, right? Well, what makes Kali dark? She beheads, but who does she behead? She beheads the ego. But what a kind of an ego? It's a male ego. It's the man. It's a man's head. It's it's Kali beheads the the, the phallic logocentrism of a, of a masculinist patriarchy. That's what she does, and I think that's why she's everywhere right now. We got students writing our dissertations on Kali, like like just like people going into Kali business, you know. <laughs> like Kali, she's everywhere. Why? Because a certain kind of masculinity is dying. Right. She's ushering it in. Yeah, thank goodness. So this is part of my phrase. This is sort of the climax of the presentation. Um, when I, this is from a very different X-Men thing. I don't know where I found this, but these things find you when you're in, you know, obsessed with research. Yeah. So I found this image, and I was just like, this is, this is it. Like, this is totally it, because this is the, the more, um, we'll just call it positive aspect of the Phoenix Force as creatrix. And this is a cosmic jouissance. This is Jean as a visionary, ecstatic mystic who's having a unitive experience with the cosmos that is participatory and evolutionary. Jean is participating in the future evolution of humanity. You can see she turns into the DNA strands, which then eventually evolves and turns into this experience of like silent, empty nothingness. And that's another aspect of Kali that's not talked about a lot. Kali also translated into Kala, which is time. And if you read like the Kashmir Shaivist texts from the 10th and the 12th century, the 10th and um, 12th century, there's this total play between Kali and Kala, and how Kali is the beginning, the Shakta, as Ma, right, who births the cosmos into creation, but she's also the Omega point. She's the end. But all of the universe dissolves into silence and nothing. She's the void. Yeah. Evolutionary until humanity becomes eternity. That's the last thing. Millions of years of exponentially increasing evolutionary growth until humanity becomes eternity. That's in a comic book. 
Like, like nobody, like we're not drinking wine and sacrificing goats or doing any crazy tantric rituals here. Like, like this is a comic book. And this is, this is, so this is what I mean when I was talking about Jeff Kreipel's thing about encoded Gnosticism and encoded Gnostic truths, right? This is the kind of stuff that's like people are putting in comics. This is like scripture, you know? <clears throat> All right. So, I gotta be kind of quick here. I want to do a thing here. I was going to just leave it there. It was supposed to just be about Trezons, and I was just going to end there. But I, I just couldn't, because what happened is, I, I, as I said in my introduction, the more I got into this material, the more I got into really the dark side of, of male constructions of femininity and female experience, and then really man, manipulation of women's bodies by men, not just comic book authors, but mostly by doctors and psychologists. So uh, I want to do this piece on hysteria because it's, it's important and it's, it's related. Um, we don't need to get into all these different models of the psyche, uh, except just to say that there were many models of the psyche at the turn of the century, and the one that won out was the unitary model of, of Charcot and Genet and Freud, for those of you that know your history of psychoanalysis. Um, and the first thing here is possession. I kind of already talked about this, about being possessed by the complex. That's very Jungian. Um, it's pretty clear, especially in the last one I showed of um, the giant flaming phoenix and how it can, like resuscitates her dead body. I mean, that's a total form of possession, spirit possession. I don't think I need to say anything more about that, but what I want to do is spend some time with the hysteria piece. So hysteria, this concept of hysteria is probably the oldest male fantasy about women's bodies on the planet. It literally dates back 4,000 years to the Egyptians. We have evidence, like, scri like scribal evidence of, of a mo what was considered to be a mobile uterus. Right? That, the, that the uterus would literally travel throughout the body, get stuck in certain places, usually the throat, and cause these experiences of emotionality, sexual excess, and excitability in women. Does the uterus move? I mean, I, maybe hers does, but like, I don't think this happens. Right? But this was a fantasy because there's no materialist evidence for it. right? So this was a fantasy of a male, male scientist, early proto-scientist, projecting theory onto women. Isn't that interesting? Right? All the way as early as the Timaeus, this is, so this is the 5th century, Plato, right? cutting off passages of the breath, impedes respiration, provokes disease. Uh, Hippocrates, he's the one who first uses the term hysteria, and then of course in the Middle Ages we have the reversal uh, where chastity becomes a virtue and any sign of sexuality or sexual hypersexuality now becomes demonic. If you've ever read the Malleus Maleficarum, The Witch's Hammer, which was the handbook for inquisitors, it's dark stuff. It's very, very dark. Right? So lust, actually in either sex, was not only seen as demonic, but it was also interpreted as female. So even a man that feels lustful, right? it's a fem it's, he's, he's been possessed by a female demon. <laughs> so this is what I was saying earlier about femininity and sexuality <coughs> becoming immersed in the shadow and becoming uh, demonified. And this continues into the 19th and 20th century. Uh, where the where hysteria becomes like the psychological disease of an era, right? it's like it's like now it's like um, like like any anybody that a therapist can't cure all of a sudden they're like just borderline they're all like, they're borderline they're borderline they're borderline well that the, the fantasy of a hundred years ago was hysteria she's hysteria it's hysteria right? and nobody knew what it was when you read this literature nobody actually knew what it was or knew what caused it it's totally based on um, speculation. And then this really powerful quote from Janet Beetzer, for almost 40 centuries, there's been an essential continuity in its association of the disease with femininity, sexuality, mobi mobility, and fluidity, which takes us back to that first image of the speculum in the mirror, right? She looks like she was poured into that uniform. <clears throat> and the title of Janet Beetzer's work is Ventriloquized Bodies, and it's very powerful, so it takes us back to this image. She says female bodily discourse, so the way we talk about women's bodies is not only an illusion, but it turns out to be a hoax.
But this, this metaphor that she uses of ventriloquy is very powerful, <coughs> because what does a ventriloquist do? Right? It takes something that's hollow, I mean, it inserts its hand inside it, it makes it talk. It gives it agency and voice. Right? And it became a really powerful metaphor for how I was looking at comic books and how comic book authors, mostly male, write women in comic books. But it's a very powerful metaphor to look at philosophy and the sciences and the arts and you know, the arts and the humanities of how men continue to write women, you know, both in and out of history, but also in scientific manuals. There's a really powerful uh, essay that James Hillman wrote in like 1967 um, called On Psychological Femininity. It's in his book, Myth of Analysis. It was an Aronos lecture that he gave. He traces the whole history. It's like a 100-page chapter. He traces the whole history of, of scientific discourse and underscores all of the misogyny Right. Very interesting. It's a very, very interesting um, essay. This is a very famous painting from André Brie at the turn of the century from the Salpetriere, which is where Charcot had his big clinic, which really oriented around hysteria. Now, what you're drawn to is Charcot and the woman exhibiting the hysterical fainting spell. But what you may not see is the painting on the wall that actually ventriloquizes the experience so that the woman knows exactly how to perform. It's almost as if she was giving cue cards. Right? And then there's all these rapt male doctors like, oh, how did you make her swoon, Charcot? Right? And the truth is, well, you know, behind all of them on the wall, that's how. They ventriloquized her. They told her what to do. Now, we're getting into more of the contemporary pop culture piece. You know Westworld? Okay. S uh, Watching it tonight. Uh, season tonight. two, episode season two. one. <laughs> Little plug. All right. Yeah. Super powerful. What happens in Westworld? It's, it's a bunch of like robotic people. right? So what's a robot? It's something that doesn't have agency. It's programmed. Right? And she, Evan Rachel Wood, is a very powerful character, not only because of what has recently come out about her uh, testifying before Congress about her experiences of sexual assault, but her character on the show is someone who is repeatedly raped and assaulted because that's her script. That's her script in this storyline. And then it, towards the end of the first season, not to ruin it, she starts to claim more and more agency over herself. And there's this really powerful line, you said people come here to change the story of their lives. I imagine a story where I didn't have to be the damsel. So she doesn't have to be the victim. She doesn't have to be the one who's constantly needing to be rescued or raped. And this other piece, this is hard to talk about. It's hard to look at. But this is something that happens in, in the Salpetriere and hysteria clinics and wards um, where doctors would take these blunt instruments and they would actually literally write on the woman's body because the idea was that it, the, the, the skin was wax-like and soft and impressionable so that you could actually write on the skin and then the marks would sort of uh, uh, rise to the surface, like, like, like ink, right? Like thinking about the comic book metaphor. And they would use this to, to, to experiment uh, and they would sometimes write a woman's diagnosis, for example, dementia praecox, which is schizophrenia, inscribed on her body but women that they thought were visited by satanic demons. You know, I mean, it's, today we would, we would call this what it is, which is abuse and assault. But, you know, it was in the turn of the century, experimentation on women's bodies. And of course, you've probably seen this. Um, what's the best way to, since hysteria was a sexualized symptom, the best way to treat hysteria was by, you know, of course, silencing the, the, the quote unquote hysterogenic zones, which of course were the ovaries. And you would do that through the application of a ovarian compressor, which women trained themselves because they, they were smart, they knew that, like, oh, well, when they put that thing on me, you know, I'm gonna stop doing what I'm doing. And a lot of the women in the Salpetre were, they were street workers, they were sex workers, they were people that had nowhere else to go, so a lot of them would go there, and then they would perform on cue because they knew they were gonna get fed, and they knew they were gonna have a bed, to sleep. So there was a whole performance piece where the, where the women were outsmarting the doctors too. Um, I think I'm going to skip this except to say um, 
I don't think I have the time or the energy to, to summarize the whole um, possession that happened at um, Loudon in, um, in France in the 17th century, but it's very, very interesting. And um, there's been a lot of literature on the possession at Loudon. And what happened was there was a woman, Jean des Anges, um, who had a visitation from uh, a priest who, who may, they may or may not have had some sort of sexual relations. And, and she ends up possessed by seven demons. And she goes through this whole like exorcism process. And what ends up happening is that she, she, she goes from being this marginalized demonic to this very uh, authorial, um, almost like sacralized woman. Because what happens is when the, when the demons leave her body, the, the inscription uh, of, of Jesus, Mary, Joseph, and the Bishop Francis de Sales are inscribed on her hand by the Holy Spirit, and she tours all over Europe with people touching her hand. You know? So it's a very interesting experience of how inscription works both ways, um, and you know, how much of that was, was her being used by bishops and male ecclesial authorities, how much of it was for her to sort of have a career and have some authority and have some prestige. It's very complicated. It's very complicated. And then the St. Hysteria piece, just to, just to name that there's been historically a conflation of femininity with eros, which we've talked about, and the erotic female with hysteria. And if I just have to name it, there's a male piece too. There's a book written, a very good book by Mark McHale called Male Hysteria. And here's you know, mapping the male hysterical body as well. And the last piece that I want to do um, is, and I'm sorry, we'll have time if you want to stick around for questions. Um, I'm realizing that we're supposed to let you go in five minutes. But the last piece I want to do, is, two more pieces for sure. I was talking about how superheroes and comic books model these sort of, uh, these superhuman realities and really challenge our constructions of reality. Right? A lot of the comic book stuff is so amazing because it's futurist oriented and it's about things that human beings aren't supposed to be able to do. Phoenix, as I mentioned, can bend time and space and she can manipulate matter with her mind. Those are things people aren't supposed to do. So following like, Jeff Kripal's work, I want to follow just, just briefly here how, how Jean Grey specifically challenges like, our constructs of reality. Right? That's how powerful she is as a woman, that she can, she manipulates and bends matter with her mind. Here she is, she just switches her outfit from her, uh, her mutant clothes to her skimpily clad bikini, just like that. And here's another example. But it's actually very brilliantly and beautifully written. She watches electrons spin faster in orbital paths around their atomic nuclei, filling themselves with energy, casting off old structures, forming new. So she can see and experience and witness the fire on a submolecular level. So now she's a physicist. Right? She's not just beautiful and powerful, she's smart. Right? So this is, this, there's a quantum thread that goes all throughout the X-Men with the Chris Claremont stuff that I just wanted to highlight and bring here. And there's this great quote from Grant Morrison. You know, what do you become? What happens if she gets smarter and smarter, more empathic and more intuitive? What do you become? Because I think this is the direction that, I mean, this is the discourse that's happening now with, with women. It's about getting smarter and smarter, more empathic and more intuitive. And I think through that discourse, men are actually evolving because now men are waking up to what it means to become smarter and smarter, to become more empathic and more intuitive. Right? We see that like in Brene Brown's work, for those of you who know her work on courage and vulnerability. This is a new kind of emotional intelligence and a discourse around that that's never happened before. And that takes us to today. Right? So the Dark Phoenix film, I said this to some of my friends here uh, over the break. This was supposed to come out this fall. And it was pushed back to, I think, the spring of 2019, um, probably because they want to contemporize it because of everything that's happening politically, maybe. Um, what has happened, though? I mean, in the last, God, just since last October, <laughs> right? Yeah, that's, what, that's, that's what's happened. Right? This is what's happening right now. So. This, this, this phoenix energy, this phoenix force, this cosmic jouissance, this empowerment 
uh, of a, a reclaiming of a, of a dark femininity. So it's, that's not dark, it's just powerful. Yeah. I don't think I need to say, because it's been demonstrated in the news nearly every day, what powerful women are doing right now, and how they're demonstrating what it means to be leaders in ways that men have never known how to be leaders in the history of the planet. It's happening everywhere. There's this great quote, oh, the quote is not yet. But there's this great quote too, right? Oprah for president. You remember this from January? Yeah. Damn, this is so powerful. I mean, this, I watched it like 12 times in a row. I mean, it was so powerful. Right? A lot of magnificent women, many of whom are in this room tonight, right? And some pretty phenomenal men. Fighting hard to make sure that they become the leaders who take us to the time when nobody ever has to say me too again. Right. Thank you, Oprah, my neighbor. <laughs> and then this is the quote I was referring to. This, this is Alanis Morissette. Who knew? She's back on the scene. Right. Patriarchy's veneer is getting less glossy, but it's going to take many, many years for this horror of conditioning to really turn around. Truth. Sorry. I needed an image to just sort of symbolize... <coughs> <laughs> but thank you for your service, Mr. Ryan. Have a nice rest of your career <laughs> elsewhere. Okay. And this is probably my favorite powerful quote from Mark McHale's book on male hysteria. I'm going to read this twice because it's just like, it's so relevant. The true male malady is the chronic inability to reflect non heroically without evasion and self deception on oneself individually. The true male malady is the chronic inability to reflect not heroically on oneself, individually and collectively. So this is pretty much a summary of what we now refer to commonly as white privilege. Okay. The reason for this is because most men, most white men, have never had to. Right? Never had to really reflect on themselves. And now it's being forced in a very, very... Um, degrading way that people's careers are being destroyed because of the ways that they have for decades uh, oppressed and abused women who are now speaking out publicly. And it's forcing men to reflect not heroically. Right? Oftentimes in prison. Sorry, I just had to throw this in there too. And the other component here is what's happened with the changing face of masculinity in this country just in the last 15 years, we're in the transgender conversation. Those of you that might know the punk rock band Against Me, their singer, formerly Tom Gable, now Laura Jane Grace, put out a whole album called Transgender Dis Transsexual, as a Transgender Dysphoria Blues. Yeah. And that's challenging. Right? Because what's happening with the changing face of masculinity is that it's challenging older forms of masculinity that don't necessarily know how to evolve or let go. Perfectly demonstrated by our phallic friend Cyclops. Speaking of Jean Grey, she used to be the weakest X-Man. Now she blasts through the heavens without batting an eyelash. Right? I wonder, is there any place anymore in her life for me? He, it's his insecurity. That's what it is. Like it's the insecurity of this, this sort of chiseled heroic masculinity that so many men have been forced into throughout their lives. That's really unfortunate and it's damaging and it's crumbling. As we can see with the recent gun control piece, because this, all, this has everything to do with gun control. The gun is the perfect symbol of phallic American masculinity that thinks that it can do anything whenever it wants to, at any time. And I think that's why there's been so much resistance to gun control. Because it challenges, it's a very gendered conversation, it challenges male authority. The gun is the preeminent symbol of a strong, powerful man. Why would you control that? It's a primal emasculation fear. Then this is the result. Uh, I won't get into this. Those of you that saw The Last Jedi, incredible, incredible demonstrations of women demonstrating new uses of power. Ways of being in places of authority that are non-patriarchal. Laura Dern's character was amazing. Okay. Ways to be leader that are effective, yet not necessarily about dominance or control. Very powerful. And then you see it in the all-female all Avengers comic book here. A-Force. 
very similar. Emma Gonzalez, right, demonstrating that vulnerability, and right, this is a Brene Brown quote, vulnerability as the birthplace of innovation, creativity, and change. It's her six, what is it, six minutes of silence. Mm -hmm. Said more than any politician could have. And this is, I'm going to end with this, bringing it back to where we began. A small post-industrial town renewing itself amidst the creative flames and sparks of creativity. This image right here is from a brew pub, Phoenixville, Pennsylvania, called Crowded Castle. I couldn't return to my house for two weeks starting the fire, so I went back to my hometown, walking down Main Street, amazed at the <coughs> images of Phoenix and flames on every single, every single building that I saw. This mural is painted on the inside of a bathroom wall. Wow. Men's room? The men's room, I guess. I, I do identify. <laughs> All right, so I walked in, turned to face the stall. This is what greeted me in December 2017. What happened was these lines from the X-Men actually came to me. And I had this surge of possibility. It was a terrible and powerful synchronicity that I was not alone. There was a force greater than myself that was guiding and working through us in our lives that for me became my last hope. When I had nothing left to give, I asked in the opening, how do you show up? And you're standing there facing down your demons, or the flames, or when everything is burning around you. So may you allow the wing of the phoenix to touch your heart with its flames to open and to stand strong in exploring and experimenting with new uses of power, to be courageous in your vulnerability, and to rise for your communities and your families and your children, most importantly for yourself, to be the last hope. So, because of all our AV tech stuff, we started at 15 minutes late, so if you need to get out of here, like, that's cool, but I'm happy to stay here if you, know, if you want to have a conversation or discussion. Um, I'm really happy to have some questions and, and, and whatever. Yes, please. What motivated you to dive into this line of this course? I'm sorry, what was the first part of What motivated you? Oh. Um... I started reading comic books again like a year ago. Um, something in me was just like, I don't know, I needed it. And uh, Jung's got the whole thing about like a man when he heads towards the second half of his life, which I am, and coming into a different relationship with the feminine, coming into a different relationship with his anima. I think that's part of it. Um, this material like claimed me in a way that it was like, uh, it was a, like felt like a bit like an archetypal possession thing. You know, like an anima complex, like something wanted to work itself out through me and in me. And, and I think that was part of it. Like I needed to go through a lot of the a lot of the points and the things I brought up, especially that last piece from Mark McHale about men and, and looking at themselves honestly and examining their male privilege and white privilege. Like I needed to go through that. That was part of the flame before the fire. Um, but the real question, the real answer to the question is like it, it came to me. You can me. So that's that's yeah. Thanks. Thank Anything else like impressions about the material? Did this speak to you? Yeah, Brian. I'm just curious about um, if you know of any female comic book writers or illustrators, as I'm assuming most of them are men, but before young men. Yeah. 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 Although now it's completely different. I mean, there are so many. I mean, it's still probably heavily outweighed, probably like seventy percent men, but at least you know, now it's. I don't know, I'm making a statistic up, maybe 30, maybe 25 percent, I don't know, but there are a lot of incredibly like award-winning female authors and illustrators. The one that I recommend to people is uh, this series called Monstrous um, by Marjorie Liu and uh, the illustrators uh, Cicada, Tom, Cicada. Um, anyway, it's like totally like gender forward, it's, it's like, it's like, it's a, pretty much an all-female cast, it's, 
it's really powerful. Um, so to answer your question, yes, like it's happening. But it's like other things. You know, this is such a male-dominated thing for so long that it's just taken it's taken a lot of things to happen for women to be able to break into it and be respected. Did you say we see more um, women writing comments, comic books and uh, illustrating comic books in um, for independent companies uh, more so than DC and Marvel? I, it started that way. Yeah, Image, Image Comics is like the one that comes to mind right now that has a number of female writers and illustrators. Um, yeah, probably just because they, they're more more of a progressive company, smaller too. But yeah, I would, I, I, but I don't know for sure now because I don't, I don't read a lot of the Marvel stuff right now. So yeah. I, don't, I don't know. Um, so the mythologically, the image of the phoenix seems kind of uniquely ungendered, especially if you take the, the form without the egg. You know, if it's just a bird that burns up and then rises again from its ashes, there really isn't gender there. So what do you make of kind of the hyper-gender image of Jean Grey? And this, the, I mean, it's like... That's a great question. That's a really good question. So I think part of it is like, so to go with the feminine Renaissance piece, like if, if the phoenix is something that dies and rises, doesn't that make it a perfect fit archetypally for a resurgence of the feminine? Maybe. I mean, I don't have any like, historical evidence for that, but at least from like a like an intuitive sort of depth psychological guess, it just seems to fit. Um, but why not the masculine? I mean, so you could argue that patriarchy has done as much damage to the masculine as it has to the feminine. And the masculine has that same need that the feminine has in the system of control that we call patriarchy. Yeah. So let's bring the phoenix to the masculine, too. Well, I think what's happening is the way that the way that the, that is happening is because it's it's happening through women. Like I really do firmly believe that women are teaching men how to be men in a different kind of way right now. So I don't know. I mean, that's a speculative question. There's no right or wrong answer. But um, part of it, the first thing I want to say is that is men, 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 which is mostly like white men and forms of masculinity are dying. So that Phoenix mythology wouldn't fit because I don't think I think it's too soon to see the rising. I think men need to have to, need to do a lot more ego check. And while that's happening, we continue to see more and more empowered and powerful women rising up and becoming like like educators and scholars and researchers and people that are creating new forms of knowledge that men are then like oh. Really, um, I, I appreciate like the, the sustained kind of meditation on sexuality and the sacred, and and just to be able to walk away from here with a lot of images of um, of of Phoenix <laughs> to to kind of keep that keep that meditation going because you know? it's just it's a really interesting kind of sexual and the sacred like makes the sacred such a right. You know, like it's it's easy access. It's in you like you already have access when sexuality and, and the sacred are um, united like that. And I just wanted to say that my intuition of why maybe chairman, but for what why for so long um, there's been the hysteria piece and equating lust with women. Like even what you said about even male lust being equated with women. My intuition about it is because is that forever men have wrongly or rightly, I don't know, thought that women are enjoying sex way more than we are. They're loud, noisy, you know, like <laughs> It's full body. There's all kinds of weird happen, weird things happening that aren't happening for men. It seems so that's kind of my my, my sure. feeling around that. And I think part of it is a mythologized physiology that you know the the petite mort, you know the little death that, that the French call the male orgasm. Like for men, there's almost like this succubus fantasy that a man orgasms, then he like loses energy, and goes to sleep, and then there's all this tantric literature. 
about these female deities that suck a man's life force and steal a man's energy in his ojas. And that's a lot of the tantric stuff about how you're supposed to retain your semen and then build up your life force so it can't be taken from you. <laughs> and I think that's part of his physiology. Right? That what happens for women physiologically is different than what happens for men. And it's interesting how that gets mythologized and ritualized and encoded in our, in our religious traditions and cultures. Men is considered men. Considered limited. Sure. There's a limited supply. Exactly. And so that dude is after like the pink button. You <laughs> sure. That's a way to look at it. Yeah. Whereas whereas a woman can be more easily sort of codified or stereotyped as the insatiable, you know, the devourer or the one who can never get enough, right? Right. Um, but what you bring up is actually a really interesting point because we've got like at least in the, the Catholic tradition, like you know, to this day, like we're going on like twenty. 100 years or whatever of celibacy. I mean, celibacy really became more of the norm in the Middle Ages, but you know, it's lasted a long time. It's like, it's just so interesting to look retrospectively at why that is. Like, why take like maybe the most powerful force on earth, right, and, and constrain it? And I know because I lived in a monastery, I know why that is. And it's, it's very Freudian. It's because it's such a powerful force. I think there was an intuition that it's, it's a sublimation piece. So there was always a connection between sex and the sacred. It was just sublimated into imaginal and visionary mystical experiences and bridal mysticism of the soul longing for God, and it becomes poeticized. But what we have not had is an incarnational erotic mysticism that can be sort of uh, ecclesially blessed <laughs> we have not had that, in, at least in the Western Catholic worldview, which is crumbling, as we all know. Um, anyway, that's what, just what your comments made me think of. You know, just how constrained and how much discourse there's been about sex. I mean, Michel Foucault built his whole career on that. Three volumes of a history of sexuality, and I don't think he finished it. Like, so many words spill around sex and sex and religion, and it's like, you know, there you go. Here we have like a comic book telling us that, well, really, you know, or the con telling us well, the other face of God is a woman in orgasm. Hmm. All right, which is very tantric. Yeah. So, forgive me if it's not right on point. However, being a member of the patriarch, born into it, and recognizing uh, the trajectory uh, going back in time to now. How do you see the patriarch being revisioned into a healthy situation given all that is happening right now? Well, I think it's the continuation of where I was going at the end of this. I mean, pretty early through the under the whole thing. Like, I think it's a continuation of things getting more. The Alanis Morissette quote: "It's a continuation of things getting more and more ugly, more and more things getting revealed." I mean, I can't wait to find out what was in. Trump's lawyer's office and all this stuff, like, it's going to keep happening. It's going to keep getting uglier and uglier. Um, and as that face of patriarchy that has been the, the, at least the superficial bedrock of, of American masculinity for so long as that continues to erode, and this is already happening, and it's not just women. Now it's our children and adolescents that are rising up and saying that what you're doing is not enough. And that's men and women, and that's what I've been thinking about a lot lately is like how powerful it is that there are young people, like 16 year olds, that are like having conversations about gender that are so much more evolved than anything that I was ever even remotely <coughs> exposed to. You know, and I'm, you know, I'm older than that. Like, so that, that's, so there, I'm not much of an optimist, <laughs> but like when I see like that, that March for Our Lives movement, I saw high school kids doing, and a lot of those kids were, were out and proud and trans or queer identified or like whatever. I was like, that's that's the future. Like I was kind of I was kind of pretty I was not optimistic until I actually saw that movement. And things had to be so awful. And there was another walkout on was it this week, past week too? Like that <coughs> nothing, absolutely nothing has happened since then. Nobody, nothing has happened with gun control. Nothing has happened. And these kids continue to march and they continue to speak out. Like that's what makes me up. That's what makes me. That's my last hope. Like my last hope is that. 
I don't know if that answers your question, but like that's how I, that's that's my hope for what the future is. Is it's like like rainbows and pride and like all sorts of people being whoever they want to be from all walks of life, just being allowed to live because that's what the vision of democracy and freedom is. Right. Bridget, did you? recognize and appreciate you being a male-identified person who um, the way that you handled this material was really uh, inspiring for me and, and great to see because we've had, especially since the Me Too movement, we have a lot of powerful women coming out and speaking about things in a very articulate, beautiful way, but we need men to join us. And the way that the tendency of men to join that conversation, a lot of times it's it's frustrating because they do the typical male thing of wanting to explain things away or come up with solutions or not really listening. And I really feel like the way that you presented all this, you focused it on, even though we're talking about the feminine and dark feminine, you kept bringing it back to this is all coming through the male perspective, keeping it in the pro proper context that it's in. And really, I feel like you really did listen to what these images and stories are telling you rather than trying to project your own onto it and not trying to tell women what their experiences are or anything like that. And I think that's really beautiful. And so I just wanted to acknowledge that. And I think that these are the conversations we need to have more is just like what you did here, I feel like you laid it all out and didn't try to come up with all these answers or solutions. Just lay it out and look at what all this is and see what comes from that. And I think that's awesome. Thanks. I, I really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, a lot of that is what was forced on me. Honestly, this would have been a, probably a completely different presentation if I had to give it in January. It probably would have come off as more of like a fallogocentric, you know, narcissistically defended man. But that's the, the fire and mudslide all that stuff. It's just like it, that while doing this. It, it, yeah. And the other piece is, you know, when I started to think about this more and more, um, I started to think about all the things that men have created and invented and thought of, and then I started thinking, well, how would things be different if, like, women did things? Like, everything from watches to chairs to gears and machinery, to like podiums and structures, like I started thinking about like all of the things that we don't have in the world because like we don't have enough female architects or engineers or designers, right? And that's and it and it literally changed the way that I started seeing. You know, it's not everything's a box, everything's a straight line, you know. Um, so it's helped me to see the world through I hope more like female or like feminine inspired. Lenses. Yeah. So that's been the gift that this material has given to me. Yes. Would you mind going back to the slide before this one? With Emma Gonzalez. The one with Emma Gonzalez. Oh. I was wondering if I could, you were, you were talking about some of the same moments uh, in the context of Shakti and Jouissance, and I was wondering if you could uh, uh, talk about maybe the two of those together and how they might reconcile or relate to one another. Yeah, that was my own sort of amplification just because I have a background in, in like a scholarly background in Hindu Tantra, um, and that's how I got into the concept of Jouissance to begin with. Um, it came through actually reading Catherine Claymont's book um, on the philosophy of rapture where she she's a psychoanalyst and a feminist and she has some great chapters in there about um, Ramakrishna and Tantra and so it, it, it just it, I don't want to do too much of like a conflation and say that oh well they're the same thing ontologically but um, I just couldn't help but like you know like my tantric bloodhound was like Oh, Jouissance, like, oh, Lacan, like, he's doing, like, this is, this is, this is shock the Tantra, like, this is putting the goddess on top, to use, like, Jeff Kreipel's phrase, you know, um, I, I'm 
not sure where you're quite where you want to go with the question. Oh, I just want to see how you talk about them together. Yeah. Yeah. So it became like a creative sort of. Um, what's the phrase I? Do you remember the phrase I used in the fall in the methods class? Creative misreading. Was that the phrase I used? Yes. Yeah. Which is a Jeff Kreipel phrase. Uh, I, I creatively met, misread the terms together mm -hmm. to see what would happen. Mm -hmm. Right? And that's, so that's what it was. And, I, and I'm not the first to make that connection, so I think it's important to say that too. But as I was going through the material, it was just like, oh my god, like, this is so clearly, I mean, because of the language, this is so clearly exhibits not only like this, this feminist psychoanalytic jouissance piece, but it's like, she is, I mean, the language is there. She becomes a god or a goddess. Right? And she's doing it in a way that is highly erotic and sexual and undermines uh, position, you know, positions, imperial authority in, in a way that's like very subversive. So it is very tantric in that regard too. Thank you. Um, so I found it interesting that some of the images of Phoenix reminded me of Mary Magdalene, in that she's pictured with red hair, uh, wearing a and she yeah. pages, and wearing green. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. yeah. And how the red-haired devil. Yes, exactly. Highly over-sexualized. Um, but she's also going through a rebirth right now. It's very, yeah, thanks for bringing that up. It's very interesting. And red, is, like red, red is like everywhere. For, you know, if you're into the, um, if you know what's happening with like sort of next generation of like spiritual teachers and, and women, most of whom are female, a lot of it is around red and Mary Magdalene. So, it's almost, it was like Kali was like this archetypal figure of like the 90s and the early millennium and then somehow she's been supplanted by Mary Magdalene figure. And now like we've got a whole bunch of students and people like do a Google search for how many books have come out about Mary Magdalene in the last like 15 years. It's like insane. So part of that is about the redemption of the feminine and I think a lot of it is specifically around um, a more positive embrace of eros and sexuality. And she's the lover of God. Exactly. She's not only the lover. She is the lover of Christ. She is the spouse of Christ, or Christ is her spouse. And it's interesting the shift from Kali, who was also, who is, and has been a very powerful force in like this sort of younger generation of, of yogi, sort of meditator, or spiritual women. There's been a shift from Kali to Mary Magdalene, and I think part of it is because it's a move away from the. It's maybe maybe there's been a turn, sort of collectively in. in archetypally away from the more destructive, devouring, feminine, and now it's like, it, it's, it's more about making love to Christ rather than demolishing the structures that represent him. <laughs> Maybe, but it's, it's a great question. Um, I feel it, I think, it's, I think there's something there. Um, but I think it's relational, for sure. Yeah. Um, I'm hesitant to bring up another old new character for you to sum up for the crowd, but I was just curious if uh, if you feel like Emma Frost kind of has a certain important role within the, the ideas that you're bringing up here. Yeah, that's a good question. So Emma Frost and a lot of this stuff, especially the later stuff, she's, um, so she becomes like, so, so Jean Grey with the Hellfire Club thing was a black queen and Emma Frost was the white queen. <coughs> And she, she's this counter to Jean throughout the X-Men story. At one point, she's like, after she dies, uh, Emma and, and Cyclops get together. It's just this whole triangulation thing. And she becomes a, uh, I don't know, she's like, she's like her antagonist. But what's interesting is she, I think she brings more of the human element, especially in the later stuff. And in that, that, that slide that I showed, the last slide I showed before break, she's the one who actually helps Jean to humanize and, and create some separation and distance between herself and the archetypal phoenix force. She helps her to sort of come back and ground in her, her humanity. So I don't know if you is there more, is there something specific that you're like seeing? Well, no, I just was, yeah, to? just kind of the various um, different types of, you know, archetypes that, that you know, what she might embody to yeah, she's, she's like the jealous, she, a lot of it is the jealous counterpoint. Grant Morrison, Grant Morrison does awesome things with her in the new X-Men because he says in an interview that she actually is like the character that he's most identified with. 
He does some really cool stuff with Emma Frost, um, including giving her like uh, like this ridiculous costume that in no way can contain her massive breasts that are just constantly spilling out all over the place and that becomes an ongoing joke too. I mean, it's really, it's, it's almost obscene what her costume looks like, but anyway, that's an aside. Um, I'll just say that she serves as like a counterpart. Um, it's like a foil, right? And, and Jean oftentimes is the good angel and Emma is like the bad angel. Like She wants to do bad things with Scott and help liberate him from all the nice things that Gene does with him. It's like that sort of thing. Anything else? It's getting late. It's 8 o'clock. Yeah, definitely. I have one. Um, well, even though she, uh, the Phoenix uh, character, obviously seems really erotic, and uh, we're talking about Eros, she also seems really solitary or lonely, just from what I'm gleaning, yeah. and this is the most yeah. I've ever learned about her. And I don't know if there's something about the negating aspect of Vuissance, or if her power is too great to relate to, or she's disembodied and dying all the time. But how do you think, oh, and I was thinking also about the phoenix, as I know it, is a singular yeah. entity at a time. Is there some, I'm just wondering how that plays into maybe some of the pain of everything we're talking about, or? It's a great question. It. It's, it's a really, really great question. It's a really hard, question that's partly why I avoided it when you asked it in the interview oh, yeah, that we did, did. like last yeah. month because it's such a good question but I'm glad you brought it up yeah um, I don't know there's this constant tension between her as being part of the team and her going out on her own and being this solo solitary figure mm -hmm. um, and I'm not going to try to solve it or mm -hmm. say it away but I think it's important to acknowledge that it's there she constantly feels like the outsider yeah. she's always stating how she doesn't feel like she's everyone else or that she's different or that she's right so there's that whole piece where she's she kind of is she's more powerful than anyone else on the team a lot of them are afraid of her and I think part of it is like she she takes this solitude she takes this space to figure out who she is so much of this whole story arc is about her and her identity and men fucking with her identity and like her needing to get away from other people that are trying to co-opt or kill her so she can figure out who she is. I think that's part of it. Yeah. Um, but it, but it's, it's definitely there. Yeah, it's, it makes her more attention. powerful in this um, yeah. emotional <laughs> yeah. way. But yeah, I'm just really curious about that. But I think for those of you that have superpowers, I'm sure there's like, I mean, y'all do, but maybe some of you are more conscious than others. Like, you gotta, like, it creates a, it does something to a person, you know, thinking of that scene where she's holding her friend that's dying when she's a girl. Like, mm -hmm. to have that kind of experience and to experience that kind of trauma at a very young age marks you as someone who is different. And it is going, it's the William James, what he calls the sick soul, right? It, it is gonna mark you for life as a person that is an outsider, maybe even outcast, and different. And that's what's so powerful about this whole idea of mutants, right? Mutant. And, since, and this is what Chris Claremont did with the X-Men that was so brilliant in the 70s and the 80s, is that mutants became overtly and politically identified with African Americans, with queer identified people, with women's liberation movement, and with anybody who was on the underside of history. And that's part of what made the X-Men so powerful and so popular, is because anybody that was reading that could identify. Anybody that was reading that was an outcast or on the margins of society could identify with these characters and it made them feel more empowered. Oh yeah, I'm a mutant, I'm a badass. You know, like that sort of a thing. Um, it, 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 it was like, it's around like sort of being like out and proud. You know? And the mutants are constantly, constantly um, demonized. Uh, they're always trying to be rounded up and, and killed or exterminated. And it's like any oppressed person can relate to that experience. Um, okay, I think I'm going to call there. It's eight. Thank you so much.